What do Jehovah Witnesses and the Da Vinci Code have in common? In this video, you'll find out. Reminder to hit the subscribe button below to stay up to date with new videos as they come out. Most people over the age of 30 remember the buzz about the Dan Brown book, The Da Vinci Code, and the movie that came out three years later that was portraying Christianity as this giant lie that started back with Constantine at the Council of Nicaea. Here's one clip to demonstrate this point. The Bible, as we know it, was finally presided over by one man, the pagan emperor Constantine. I thought Constantine was a Christian. Oh, hardly. No, he was a lifelong pagan who was baptized on his deathbed. Constantine was Rome's supreme holy man. From time immemorial, his people had worshipped a balance between nature's male deities and the goddess, or sacred feminine. But a growing religious turmoil was gripping Rome. Three centuries earlier, a young Jew named Jesus had come along, preaching love and a single God. Centuries after his crucifixion, Christ's followers had grown exponentially and had started a religious war against the pagans. But we can at least agree that the conflict grew to such proportions that it threatened to tear Rome in two. So Constantine may have been a uh, lifelong pagan, but he was also a pragmatist. And in 325 Anno Domini, he decided to unify Rome under a single religion, Christianity. Christianity was on the rise. He didn't want his empire torn apart. And to strengthen this new Christian tradition, Constantine held a famous ecumenical gathering known as the Council of Nicaea. And at this council, the many sects of Christianity debated and uh, voted on well, uh, everything from the acceptance and rejection of specific gospels to the date for Easter to the ministry of the sacrament and of course the immortality of Jesus. I don't follow. Masha, until that moment in history Jesus was viewed by many of his followers as a mighty prophet, as a great and powerful man, but a man the mass. Immortal man. Some Christians held that Jesus was mortal. Some Christians believed he was divine. Not the son of God? Not even his nephew twice removed. The clear portrayal here is that Constantine forced the hand of the bishops at the Council of Nicaea to make Jesus look as if he was God and also the son of God. This move was to appease his Roman pagan citizens by marrying the two religions together. So the outlook here on church history would be that Jesus died around 30 AD and then for the next 300 years up until 325 the church was not teaching Jesus was God. Then Constantine called all the bishops to come to Rome and form the Council of Nicaea and told them to change that Jesus was God and also the Son of God to appease the pagans in his empire. At that point, the spread of the lie continued through the Roman Catholic Church all the way to modern day Christianity. And so the idea that Jesus is God or the Son of God or that he ever made himself out to be God has just been the greatest lie that's been ever told. This outlook is reinforced by Jehovah Witnesses today. In another 2013 article, Should You Believe in the Trinity, they say that the Trinity became officially formulated in 325 CE. The creed attributed to the Council of Nicaea set out to be the first official definition of Christian orthodoxy. When Constantine became sole ruler of the Roman Empire, professed Christians were divided over the relationship between God and Christ. Was Jesus God, or was he created by God? To settle the matter, Constantine summoned church leaders to Nicaea, not because he sought religious truth, but because he did not want religion to divide his empire. Constantine asked the bishops, who may have numbered into the hundreds, to come up with a unanimous accord, but his request was in vain. He then proposed that the council adopt the ambiguous notion that Jesus was of one substance with the Father. This unbiblical Greek philosophy term laid the foundation for the Trinity doctrine as later set forth in the church creeds. Indeed, by the end of the fourth century, the Trinity had essentially taken the form it has today, including the so-called so third part of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. So both Jehovah Witnesses and Dan Brown promote the idea that the at-large Christian church today is based on a 1700-year-old lie. This gives us perspective when discussing matters with Jehovah Witnesses. 
because they'll see any theologian or church institute post Nicaea as just a byproduct of this lie. That is why Jehovah Witnesses won't read or accept any material that you try to hand them, because they see themselves as the only one true religion, and that the Watchtower Society is the only one that is accurately producing any materials. So what angle could you take on this matter? So let's go back and look at their proposed timeline. We can look at anything that happens before 325 at the Council of Nicaea as a pre-Constantinian period, you know, the emperor who enforced this giant lie upon the world. From this viewpoint, Jehovah Witnesses would then be claiming that believers and leaders of the local churches for 300 years were not teaching Jesus was God. The church was not an organized hierarchy during this time period. They are made up of local churches, mainly with elders and bishops ruling over their congregations. So the question here we only have to ask is, did the second and third century Christians actually believe Jesus was God or not? First we have Ignatius of Antioch. Remember, Antioch was the first place where believers were called Christians in the book of Acts. Ignatius was the disciple of the Apostle John and was martyred during Emperor Trajan's reign. His seven surviving works can still be read today. From his letter to the Ephesians, he says, For our God, Jesus the Christ, was conceived by Mary according to God's plan, both from the seed of David and of the Holy Spirit. You can clearly see here that Ignatius is calling Jesus God. From also in the same letter, he says, when God appeared in human form. In another, in his letter to the Romans, for our God, Jesus Christ, is now more visible that he is in the Father. In his letter to the Smyrna, I glorify Jesus Christ, the God, who made you so wise, for I observe that you are established in an unshakable faith, having been nailed, as it is were, to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Also in his letter to Polycarp, another church leader, he says, Wait expectantly for the one who is above time, the eternal, the invisible, who for our sake became visible, the intangible, the unsuffering, who for our sake suffered, for our sake endured in every way. You can clearly see that Ignatius says Jesus is God incarnate, he is also eternal, and in that he died on a cross and not a torture stake. Since he is a disciple of the Apostle John, this should say more because he would have received the understanding of who Jesus is from John himself. Remember, Jehovah Witnesses see Jesus as a created being and insist that John 1-1-C means the word was a God and not was God. And so if John's apostle is not calling Jesus a God or a created being, but eternal God incarnate died on a cross, then what does that tell you about Jehovah Witnesses misconstruing what John 1-1 says today? Another disciple of the Apostle John is Polycarp of Smyrna. In his letter to the Philippians, he states, Our Lord and God, Jesus Christ. So we have two disciples here of the Apostle John that became bishops of their local churches that are clearly teaching Jesus is God incarnate. Why would they have believed this if John really meant that Jesus was a created spirit person before the foundation of the world? This is a good question to ask Jehovah Witnesses. Whether if they accept your question or not, or they believe your statement, that's not the point. You're just trying to plant a seed of doubt about what they believe and have been taught by the Watchtower Society. Next is Mileto of Sardis from the late 2nd century AD. He states in one of his letters, He that hung up the earth in space was himself hanged up. He that fixed the heavens was fixed with nails. He that bore up the earth was bore up on a tree. The Lord of all was subjected to shame in a naked body. God put to death. Further on he says, because they slew God who put on bodily form. He is clearly calling Jesus God here. Now the idea of God dying to a Jehovah Witness or even a Muslim or to a Jew is just unconscionable. But the point here is that you're obviously quoting somebody from early Christianity that says that Jesus was God and that he was put to death and that ultimately they will say that he was resurrected back to life as well. So here are a few more quotes just to have at your disposal in case somebody questions the idea that you're just picking the only two people that said this. The first here is Irenaeus of Lyons. He says, Christ himself, therefore together with the Father, is the God of the living who spoke to Moses and who was also manifested to the fathers. That's interesting that Irenaeus says that Jesus was the one who spoke to Moses. The reference here that he is making is that at the burning bush and that he is stating that Jesus was the one who was in the burning bush. 
Now, if you read Exodus 3, it clearly says that God appeared to Moses in the burning bush and spoke to Moses. And he told him to remove his sandals because you're on hollow ground, all that stuff. But it's clearly saying that God was the one who was in the bush. And then if you look at any other passage that talks about God appearing to Moses, Irenaeus is saying that was Jesus who was doing it at that point in history. The next here is we have Tertullian. He states, For God alone is without sin. Yeah, and the only man without sin is Christ, since Christ is also God. So Tertullian is actually acknowledged as one of the first Christian apologists. You can see the kind of the logical equation that he is making here. He says that God is without sin, and only Christ is without sin. So therefore, God is Christ, or Jesus is God. And so it's good to know that we have Tertullian that was already exercising these types of logical statements in early Christendom in the second century AD. The next we have is Hippolytus. The Logos alone of this God is from God himself. Wherefore also the Logos is God, being the substance of God. This is clearly coming from the Gospel of John because the, when in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God, the Word is the word Logos in Greek. And so he is clearly grabbing from John 1.1 1, 1 to make this clarification that Jesus is actually God incarnate. This is another good place to turn in case you get into the debate about John 1.1 1, 1 and with the Jehovah Witnesses and them saying, no, he was just a God. Here's another church father who clearly is stating the Logos is God himself of the same substance. Next we have his origin. His statement says, Jesus Christ in the last times, divesting himself of his glory, became a man and was incarnate although God and while made a man remained the God which he was. This sounds a lot like Philippians chapter 2, which is one that Christians would clearly point to and say, look, there, Paul is calling Jesus God. Jehovah Witnesses have kind of worked their magic on the New World Translation to make Philippians chapter 2 not appear as if Paul is calling Jesus God. Now, a Jehovah Witness or an antagonist might just say, but that's just proof that the lie even started even earlier than Nicaea. So if you need an outside source, here's one that you can use. Pliny the Younger was a Roman governor under Emperor Trajan in the early 2nd century AD. He wrote to the Trajan asking how he should handle Christians in his area. Just a reminder that during this time we are only 50 years removed from Nero going nuts in Rome and persecuting Christians after he accused them as the ones lighting Rome on fire. In one of his letters to Trajan, his description is extremely valuable to us today. He says that Christians were singing songs to Jesus as to a God. This is clear external evidence that early Christianity saw Jesus as God. Did 2nd and 3rd century Christians before Nicaea see Jesus as God? Yes. Was the idea of Jesus being God of some gradual evolution of Greek pagan origins that got instituted at Nicaea? No. So the outlook of the early church leaders who were centuries before Constantine and geographically removed from one another is that they clearly taught that Jesus was God. They obviously didn't hold a Unitarian belief either because they saw that there was God the Father and also that there was God the Son. And if you read through any of their other materials, you will also see that they taught God the Holy Spirit as well. And so they can be clearly seen as Trinitarians. The first use of the word Trinity was actually done by Tertullian, who was 150 years before Constantine and the Council of Nicaea. So any group that is trying to teach that post-Nicene church history is just nothing but the greatest lie ever told is one, teaching bogus history. They are simply just rewriting the narrative that was handed down from early Christendom. And number two, they're disgracing the lives of the believers who lived under extreme persecution to the likes of which that nobody in the West can fully appreciate today. In the next part, we're going to examine what happened in 4th century AD Christian history from Emperor Domitian to Emperor Theodosius I. A reminder that our goal here is to be equipped and confident enough to invite Jehovah Witnesses into our home and have a conversation with them. Our idea is that we are here to learn how to plant seeds of doubt into their mind about what the Watchtower Society has been teaching them all these years. Below you'll see a link to a handout that will have these quotes at your disposal because we are told in 2 Peter 3 that we should always be ready to give an account for the hope that lies within us. So leave a comment below about how this video has helped you and any other pre-Nicaea evidence that you have found helpful when talking with Jehovah Witnesses. In the meantime, stay salty.